This is professional surfer John Florence. We're currently located off the coast of one of the best surf breaks in the entire world, Bonsai Pipeline. That, that was the ocean. Wishing John a good morning. Having lived smack dab in the center of cornfield land for my entire life, it's pretty special when you get to see masses of water as big as these waves moving so freely. But that isn't really what I want to focus on in this video. Instead, I want to show you the start to finish process of creating a realistic curling wave in Blender. Just a fair warning before we get started here, this is not technically a tutorial, so I am going to be skipping a few steps, however if you're really dedicated and you do have a sufficient knowledge of Blender and how simulations work, then you should be able to follow this like a tutorial. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. Part 1. Research in order to be able to effectively create waves in Blender, I first have to know how they form in the real world. That way I can replicate it in Blender. Here's a quick summary of what I learned. Waves originate from a few different sources. Ocean currents, tides, and from wind itself. Often, the waves on the north shore of Oahu are caused by distant storms combined with the powers of the ocean currents. This combination allows for the waves to be very powerful, which is part of the reason that they break like they do. So, we know if we want to replicate these waves, the first thing we'll need is a very powerful wave source. The next thing we need to investigate is why waves break. The answer is actually surprisingly simple. Waves break when the bottom part of the wave slows down, while the top part maintains its original velocity. This difference in velocity causes the top part of the wave to overtake the bottom, resulting in a curling or breaking wave. So what causes the bottom part of the wave to even slow down in the first place? Well, it's the incline of the shore beneath it. The incline forces excess water up into the base of the wave, making it more massive and causing more friction between the actual fluid particles. Meanwhile, the top of the wave stays just about the same as it was before, causing the difference in velocities. This information leads us to the second thing we need, underwater topology that will create massive waves. The final thing we need to find is somewhere where we can simulate these waves. This is where Blender comes in. Now, Blender's default fluid simulation model is alright, but it could really be improved, and that's why I decided to use the Flip Fluids beta add-on for Blender in order to do this project. The Flip Fluids Blender add-on allows for a much more detailed mesh to be generated from the surface, as well as having built-in whitewater generation. So now that we know what we need, let's go ahead and build a model. So for my research, here's what I need in order to make that model work. 1. A wave maker, something powerful enough to make that wave break. 2. A sea floor that causes the bottom of the wave to slow down. And finally, we need the actual fluid we're going to be creating the waves in. While attempting to simultaneously draw, hold a camera, and keep the camera in focus all with one hand, I was able to finish up two different models. Both of these models are relatively similar. The black outline is the domain, the orange solid on bottom is the sea floor, and the blue solid on top is the actual body of water. The red solid is the wave maker, or what I've started calling the pusher. This is what varies between the two different models. In model 1, the pusher moves vertically, causing the waves that way, whereas in model 2, it moves left to right, or horizontally. Now, there are two main variables that I can change in each of these models. One, the shape of the pusher, and two, the shape of the seafloor. For the sake of diversity, and in hopes that one of these would produce a better result than the standard flat pusher, I ended up creating six different variations of each pusher for each model. Additionally, I also created six different seafloor variations to test to see which one formed waves the best. Now, it's time to put these different models and different variations to the test. I started by making a base model, something that I could iterate later and create different tests from. This base model consisted of a domain, the fluid object, a linear sloped seafloor, and a flat vertical pusher. From this base model, I created four different tests to try out different aspects of my model that I mentioned before. So let's take a look at those and the results I got from them. Test 1. Vertical Pushers. 
The top left is the flat or control pusher. I'm judging these waves based on a few different criteria. One, I want to make sure that the wave does actually break. And if it does break, I'm judging it by the shape and also where it breaks because we don't want these breaking all the way out by the pusher. Additionally, I'm looking for what I'm going to call side effects of these different pushers. Things like excessive splashing above the pusher or early wave breaks are things that are undesirable for our final product. We'll compare the best waves at the end. Test 2, horizontal pushers. The top left is still the flat pusher as well. Now it doesn't take long to already notice the difference in the formation of waves between the horizontal and vertical pusher. The horizontal pusher here likes to form really big, really clean rolling waves right off the bat. I also want to draw your attention to the convex pusher in the upper right. Just look at how clean those waves are. It is definitely the best wave maker out of all the different horizontal pushers. So what have we learned from this testing? For one, we now know the difference in the waves made by the horizontal and vertical pushers. The vertical pusher tends to create slow rolling waves which develop as they approach the shore. On the other hand, the horizontal pusher generates immediately curling waves right at the source. We'll be able to utilize these different types of pushers to make different waves later on. Additionally, we now know which pushers produce the best waves. I thought the best waves out of the vertical pushers were the front bevel and front indent pushers. From the vertical pusher category, I selected the flat pusher and the convex pusher. Let's look at test 3, the seafloor grade. I tested 4 5 degree increments starting at 5 and ending at 20. Honestly, this test didn't really yield that much information. The only thing I learned from it is that the longer a wave goes, the less chance it has of actually crashing. This leads us to our final test, which is the different styles of seafloors. Just as before, our top left is the control. One relationship I did notice while reviewing this footage is that waves tend to form better on surfaces that don't have a very steep grade. If you look at the square or decay seafloor styles, you'll notice they have trouble forming because of how much backwash is coming off of the steep surface. The two different seafloor styles I want you to pay special attention to here are the linear and reef shore styles. These two were the absolute best at generating realistic waves. Personally, I like the look of the reef waves best. They have a nice, tall, round shape, and they don't suffer from backwash as much as the linear waves do. So, from that testing, here's what I've decided to use in my final simulation. For the pusher, I'm going to be using the front bevel pusher. This pusher generated very clean rolling waves with limited side effects, making it the best pusher for this purpose. I'm going to try and use an average shore grade between 10 and 15 degrees because this generated nice rolling waves while limiting the effects of backwash. Last, I'm going to be using the reef shore style to get the most realistic waves that I possibly can. So let's make this thing. After about 8 hours of tweaking settings, 48 hours of baking, and an entire week plus a few days dedicated solely to rendering, here is my final result. Yeah, in the front row kicking back old school trash like damn, can't get enough of this mode like I don't even know where I am, ooh baby get hyped to the beat, let's go cause this is our jam. This is our jam. Let's go. Oh. This project has been a massive undertaking. I don't think I've ever done a single project that took as long and required as much rendering and baking as this one. But in the end, I'm still proud of it. Whenever I finish a project, I always like to look back on it and think about what I could have improved to make the project better. So I figured I'd share my thoughts on this one with you. The first thing that comes to mind is the whitewater generation from the flip fluids add-on. Whitewater in the real world is a pretty resilient thing, and it stays on the surface of the water for quite a while after it's been created. 
But with my simulation and the settings I used for whitewater generation, the whitewater particles disappeared only a few seconds after being generated, so they didn't get that harsh surface coverage that you see in a lot of the drone footage I showed earlier in this video. The size of the whitewater particles was also an issue. From a distance, it actually looked pretty good, but as soon as you got within a few meters of the water, it, you could just see a bunch of spheres chilling on the surface, and it honestly ruined a lot of the immersion for me. So this is something I'd also like to revisit. Another thing I wish I could have implemented into this wave was mist. In the real world, when a wave begins to curl, it casts a trail of mist off the crest of the wave, and when it curls over, there's just like a cannon of mist that just shoots out of the barrel. And it's, it's a really cool, um, very visually appealing aspect of waves that I couldn't replicate due to technical limitations with Blender and the Flip Fluids add-on. The last thing I wish I could have implemented was some sort of sand and water interaction. In the real world, when a wave crashes, especially right on the shore like these were, they suck up a lot of sand into the wave and it creates this really cool cloudy yellow contrast within the wave, uh, as you can see in this photo by Clark Little. So I think this could have really added to the appeal of this simulation, but unfortunately we'll have to do without it. So, I guess with those final notes out of the way, this marks the end of a 4 month project for me. So, with that, I want to say thank you for watching, and for those of you who are subscribed to me, thank you for being so patient with me. I haven't uploaded a video in four months because I've been just bogged down with this, and I've also been hosting a weekly tutorial series on the CG Cookie Blender Training YouTube channel. So, it's been, it's been a long time since I've uploaded here. Again, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Adios.